welcome to React Native Radio, episode 96. I'm your host, Natter Dabbit. Today on our panel, we have Peter Pykarczyk. I'm back, everybody. Welcome back, Peter. Our special guest today is Tyler McGinnis. Welcome to the show, Tyler. Hey, what's up, everyone? Glad to be here. Tyler, can you kind of give us an intro of who you are for those that haven't already heard of you and kind of know who you are? Yeah, absolutely. So I, uh, I work full-time on a little site called TylerMcGinnis.com. I do a lot of teaching. Uh, so a lot of blog posts, if you've seen any of my stuff, it was probably a blog post. I built out Udacity's React Nano degree. Uh, so yeah, just a lot of teaching, a lot of like community driven stuff. So some open source stuff. Um, but that's basically what I do is just kind of living the dream, uh, working full time on my own stuff. So today's episode is going to be kind of veering away from React Native specific stuff. And we're going to talk about the new React APIs that are coming out. We're also going to talk about using React on the web. So a lot of developers that are listening to this uh, show probably maybe either are like doing some React web development work or they, um, they've they done that in the past or whatever. It's a good thing maybe for us to kind of keep up to date with what's going on and just have a discussion about what tools and stuff are currently up to date. Because if you're like deep diving on React Native, you may be stuck in um, that ecosystem for a year or so and, and not really keeping up with everything so I think it'll be a good refresher, you know, just on React in general, like the, uh, again, the APIs that have, that have changed, the context and the lifecycle stuff that's changed up, but also just kind of tooling in general. And I think Tyler is like a really good guest to have on to talk about this stuff. So um, we'll kick it off by, I guess, can you kind of give us a quick, like, introduction to, like, the changes that were made, like, is that, like, going to be in, in React 17? Are they going to be, like, deprecated? deprecating some of this other stuff or like how does that work so the biggest ones that are going to affect like public facing stuff uh that come to mind are new context uh which i'll talk about in a sec and then a lot of the life cycle uh events are changing and what's weird about react is such it's in such an interesting spot right now because there were just a bunch of changes and even more than that uh dan abramov gave a talk uh, it was about what six weeks ago now uh, where he talked a little bit about even more future stuff that isn't really out yet, which is kind of theoretical at this point. Um, so whenever we talk about like at least this point in time, whenever we talk about like new React stuff, it's always like the stuff that's really kind of out now as of 16.3, uh, which was, I think it was released like a, a week or two ago. And then also stuff beyond that. Uh, and we didn't really kind of talk about both of them. So as far as the newer stuff that's out, um, so we could start with the... Uh, the lifestyle events. Uh, um, so things like component will receive props or will receive props. Um, all of the will uh, lifecycle events uh, will mount. Uh, and I know there's a few other ones. All of those are being deprecated. And deprecated is kind of a weird word. It's a very strong word. Uh, as of right now, as of 16.3, I believe, and it may even be 17, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, guys. Uh, I know they're getting their names changed to capital unsafe, like underscore, and then and then the original name. Um, I'm not sure if those changes were made in 16.3. Um, I'm pretty sure they're going to be made in React 17, which who knows when that will come out. Uh, but that's but that's the idea is uh, there are those those will lifecycle events are being deprecated if you want to say that um and then there are a few new ones uh get derived state from props is cool because it basically allows you like like i just said to or like the name implies uh to derive the state of your component uh based on the props that it's receiving um and a lot of people talk about how that's kind of a replacement for component will receive props uh to me it's it, it kind of is, but I actually think component uh, did mount is a better replacement for it. Uh, once you start getting into like the differences of like the updates and whatever. Um, so that's kind of where we're at is like, if you were using component, will receive props, uh, probably try to start using component to mount. Um, if you were using, what else was there? Component will mount, co use component did mount. Um I think everything else, as far as like the life cycle events, is relatively the same. Correct me, did I did I miss anything, Natter? So no, I think that that basically covers it. Like, uh, there's something interesting to note though about the uh, I think it's called the Git derived state from props is that it's kind of like a static. It's a static uh, method. Yeah. 
So like you can't refer to this. So um, just, you know, it's something to keep in mind when you're kind of structuring your code because you can't, again, refer to anything within the class. You can only kind of return new state from there, uh, at least to the best of my knowledge. Yeah, I think yeah. you're right. Oh, yeah, totally. So you, you return state, and it's kind of funky because you no longer do, like, next props. It's, it's all, like, previous props, you know? Uh, okay, so yeah. that's interesting. And that's what kind of threw me off because coming from component will receive props, uh, that was getting past it. And this is kind of all going off memory, so I could be wrong. Um, that lifecycle gets past, yeah, the next props. So you're able to compare the previous props basically with like the next props that are coming in. Um, but the one we're talking about, um, there's so many, so much in my head right now. Uh, get derived state from props doesn't receive, I believe it's the, pr the previous props. So what you need to do, and this, then again, I could be all wrong here, but if I recall, what you need to do is if you, if you want to compare the previous props inside of get derived state from props, you need to set it on state. So you basically have a reference to that. So so that's why it's it's weird, and I don't I haven't really like asked anyone why this is because everyone, like I mentioned earlier, everyone always says that get derived state from props is kind of a replacement from component will receive props, but they're past two different things. So in my mind. Component did mount at least is a more seamless replacement for component will receive props. I could be wrong. That's kind of just what I've seen migrating some of my stuff over. It's so interesting that um, we went so long with React being like pretty stable. And not that it's not stable now. It's kind of like, you know, still pretty stable. But like we're seeing quite a few changes. And you didn't mention that they're going to be possibly making more changes. I'm wondering if this is going to affect uh, developers like that are either coming into React or working already within React. Because remember when Angular kind of made that big shift from one to two? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like a lot of people kind of like were put off by a lot of the complexity about it. But really the main issue at that point, in my opinion, was kind of like the fact that, were, that there was no stable version available for like two years. Like, I, so that's not really happening with uh, React. But, um, but yeah, I'm wondering I if that's going to like, you know, throw off any new developers or if we're going to shed... Um, our like current momentum like within the React ecosystem. Yeah, I, I actually this is a really good point, and it's something I don't say on Twitter because I try to be like very non-controversial on Twitter for good reasons. Uh, but something that's interesting about React, and again, this isn't like to discredit anything that's going on in the React space. I love it; it's all it's all necessary. Uh, but what I loved about React was it was it was just very simple, right? Like you had a component, that component received props, and then you rendered some UI, or you like rendered a description of the UI. Uh, and, it, and it may have some state if you wanted it to. And so like the, uh, as, as Kent Dodds always says, like the pit of, pit of success, right? Was pretty large as far as React was concerned, because once you actually got things set up, like avoid, like let's pretend like Webpack and all that stuff did, doesn't exist, right? Once you were actually had like a, an app running, uh, it was the, the kind of the mental model was pretty simple. Um, like I mentioned, you had props and then you render some UI, kind of really similar to a function, right? A function takes in an argument, it renders or it returns something, a component takes some props and it returns some UI. Well, now it's like, it's more than that, right? You have context now, you have like this async rendering stuff that's being talked about. And so the, the mental model for React is it's still like, I, I think it's still, it's more simpler than like Angular 4 or whatever the new Angular is. Uh, but it definitely is, it's one of those things with like, it's, it's a lot more powerful now. Uh, but I feel for the beginner who's just getting into it because now they're trying to kind of manage what's new and what's old and like what are breaking changes, what are going to be the breaking changes coming up. And like, there's just the, the mental model for understanding React and building a React app is arguably a lot more complex than it used to be. And I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, uh, but I think that's just the reality of it. Tyler, that's a really good point uh, because I've been on this adventure for the last 2018, four years maybe, right? Around four years. And <laughs> I don't even know what I would do as a beginner right now, right? Like imagine reading some uh, like blog posts online and then like looking at the Re react docs and seeing like unsafe in front of all. Yeah. The yeah, exactly. And you're like, what the, what the heck is this? Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if like the ecosystem kind of like partitions itself for a little bit, you know, where you'll have like uh 16.3 people 
So, so yeah. uh, sixteen point three still doesn't have the unsafe prefix. I think I, I, that'll come the next one maybe. Yeah, if it does, I know the original ones still are going to work because that that they wouldn't make that breaking change in a in a minor release like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So maybe like we'll see like the. Uh, I know some people that are still using 15, actually, just because they haven't been able to upgrade their code. Yeah, totally. Um, it's, yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what the next few months or the rest of the year will look like in terms of just, like, fragmentation across the community. Yeah, and it's, it's such a hard problem to solve because, like, it depends, it depends what angle you take. Like, if you're looking from the React team, like, obviously they need to progress and stay... Up to date, they have all these ideas they wanted to do for so long now, and they're starting to implement them. But with those come, yeah, with those come, unfortunately, breaking changes, um, which for someone who like, who they go, they they do their job, they come home, they hang out with their family, they, they don't really care to stay up to date with the latest like trends or whatever. Like they just want to like, their job is a way for them to make money. Like it, it could be overwhelming because now they have their app and they still have features they need to add inside of their application. Uh these things are completely different. So I don't know. It's 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 the it's the same conversation we always have when there are breaking changes. It's great for some people, bad for others. Uh, progress is typically like worth the suffering of some people. Um, but the rea- reality is like uh, there are a lot of changes coming in React. Um, they're all fantastic changes if you're if you're like a developer and you want like the latest uh, and greatest whatnot. But yeah, with that, unfortunately, comes um, some headache as far as like updating and stuff. So, yeah, totally. So it's I, definitely a conversation okay. that should should happen. Um, you know, again, like you mentioned, it's not a good or a bad thing. Depending, it's not just a good or a bad thing. It depends on like how, how yeah. you look at it. Um, like in general, like you know, they're doing this for a reason. Um, it's going to yeah, benefit. Exactly. We're going to have benefits, but like you know, there are definitely always you know trade offs and stuff. So, Peter, I didn't mean to interrupt yeah. you. Oh, no worries. Um, I I wanted to add earlier that it wasn't the prep props is uh, happening on the another new method called get snapshot before update. I was confused. I was confusing myself with get derived state from props, which is still what still consumes next props and previous state. But get snapshot before update consumes prep previous props and the previous state. Gotcha. Yeah, I've like that's that's a good example. Like I haven't even looked at that one. Like I, I heard that was announced and I was like, uh like I read about it and I was like, I don't think I'd ever use that. And so I haven't looked at it since. So I, I like literally I teach React for a living, uh, and I couldn't really tell you what the point of that lifecycle method was. Um, and it's and it's one of those where it's like what I do is like and this is probably what a lot of people do is like they'll read it and they'll be like, Okay, I don't really see how this will be like applied to what I'm doing. And then you see Dan tweet like, Hey, this one probably won't be used that often, except unless you're like writing a library, and then you're like, Okay. I don't need it, and then you forget about it. That's exactly what I did. Yep. Uh, ho- hopefully, I'll never need it, but if I do, it's there. Uh, yeah, I don't know why I said that, but if you, if you do that, I guess don't feel bad because I think everybody does that. There's like this uh, marinating stage for me, you know, where I'll like, like, ah, I'll read it over. Uh, I don't know what this is doing. And then, like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like a week later, it just kind of all clicks, you know? Yeah, like, totally. it's like, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, don't know how that happened, but now it makes sense. So now I'm going to use it. Yeah, or even where you're like, hey, I have this weird use case. Like, I, w- I need to do this thing. And then you're like, oh, wait a minute. Like, doesn't that random thing I read a year ago do this thing? And then you read it and you're like, yeah, there we go. Yeah. yeah. I think that's, <laughs> and, that's a, and that's a good, like, I think that's a good, I don't know if, what it is, but uh, as far as like education goes, like, it's so hard to stay up to date with everything nowadays. Uh, that I think if you're just like kind of aware of some stuff, uh, when you need it, your brain is like, wait a minute, didn't we read about this one random thing like on Hacker News six six months ago? And then like then you find it, right? At least that's what I do. Uh, yeah. Just being aware of a lot of stuff. There's also, uh, I don't know if you two knew about Create Ref, but you can like set like, a, like your refs, you know how you set them as like instant variables and you used to uh, function? Uh, now it looks like you can do like a ref is equal to react dot create ref right yep. inside the component. I've never, I've never seen that before myself. I don't know if that's new or not. Uh, but it's new. I'd actually don't even know. 
did that make it into 16.3? I've seen it. That was another one where I was like, oh, create ref. That looks cool. I just like, I don't mind like functional refs. So I'll just keep using those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> basically basically maybe this is maybe this is saying something like react is getting to the point and, and maybe this is me i'm just like a lazy learner where it was like i i when i see things that i can already do like like for example this one like i don't mind the functional ref and i was like ah, i don't like it's just another way of doing it it's more beginner friendly which is which in my mind is always a great thing uh but like functional refs are working fine for me uh maybe one day if this like great ref thing becomes like standard i'll i'll start using it but for now like uh I just plan on using the functional like ref. I don't, I don't know if that's a, a good thing or a bad thing, but like, that's the reality of it. Uh, and that's kind of how I think about it. And I guess that's kind of one way I kind of deal with all of these changes is like, if this change becomes like the standard way to do it, I'll do it. And if not, then I'll just keep doing it the way I've had been doing. Uh, that helps me sleep at night, I guess. No, yeah. I think that works for most developers. And uh, it's probably good to hear that. Uh, people listening, like, you know, even us, like, we kind of treat this that way because I, sometimes when you're on Twitter and you're following, like, the smartest and, like, most, like, vocal and active people in the world, like, in a certain industry, you start feeling a little left behind because these people are, like, not only, like, using this stuff, but they're doing crazy shit with it. And you're like, oh, my God, yeah. I'm, like, so far behind everyone in the world. But in reality... Like those are just a very small percentage of the people, and um, you shouldn't feel that you should know everything that they know. Yeah, I agree, and especially when it comes to people like Dan and or like anyone. Or, uh, there's just so many of them on the React team. Um, they're just they're really good at being vocal. They're really good at like being vocal in a good way. Like they're they're very communicative, um, and it gets to the point where like they're having a Twitter thread, and you have no idea what they're talking about. Um, and it's just like, should I know what they're talking about? And then you're, you're like imposter syndrome, and then you're, you're like, you feel bad, and then you kind of get over it eventually, right? I think, I think that's a good point. It's like, it's, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to get too philosophical here, but like, all of us are developers. Like, most of us do it to make money, like to provide for our families, or like to do whatever to buy new shoes, like whatever it is. And like, you shouldn't feel bad if you're a developer who like, like even if you're listening to this podcast, like, that's great. If you're not listening to this podcast, that's great too. It's like uh, I, I feel like there's there's so much like pressure to like stay up to date with the latest and greatest and like be the smartest in this industry. That like even if you're just like a good developer, you feel like this imposter syndrome that you're not keeping up with stuff. And I feel like that's like uh, for the most part pretty unwarranted because like yeah, I don't know, you're doing great regardless of if like you're super up to date with everything. Yeah, and. So I was actually just talking about imposter syndrome with a friend of mine who's just getting started with like programming or whatever. Uh -huh. um, he was just like, oh, we, you know, we met up a few days ago and I was like, how how's your journey been? Because I've been out of town like the last couple of months. And he's uh -huh. like, oh, I'm not so sure anymore, you know, and I'm like, well, what happened? Uh, well, you know, like I read about all these like fantastic people. I read about how. You know, they start when they're like in their teens and, you know, like I'm in my 30s and I just like yeah. can't make it happen, you know, and I'm like, no, like you can't say that. I mean, I was like, listen, you're always going to feel like, you know, you're not good enough. You know, I was like, I feel like I'm not good enough all the time. You know, like, you know, people that I follow online feel like they're not good enough. That's just kind of like yeah. almost human nature. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think this, I mean, this is a topic I could talk about for days because I'm around beginners so often. Uh, it's so true. It, it's like, like, but it's funny because when you're a beginner and people tell you this, you don't believe them regardless of like how like passionate they are because you always feel like you're different, right? Like I remember when I was a beginner, I, people would say this and I'd be like, uh, yeah, but like I'm different. Like I'm not as smart as everyone, you know, but it's something that like universally, like everyone goes through it. Um, and I think, yeah, it's, it's just one of those things where, persistence and it's like it's like the, the cliche answers right just like keep keep going with it being persistent like asking for help when you need it um eventually you'll succeed but everyone and, and again i'm getting on my like soapbox here um this is like the educator in me but like what i've seen is like everyone eventually everyone succeeds right the difference is some people succeed after a month and some people succeed after like four years right um, and that's different for everyone that's the reality of it uh, but as long as you're aware of that and you're like continuing and you continue to progress, uh, I think that's what you need to focus on rather than like 
oh, do I have a job yet? Or am I like, do I know this like brand new React API? Like doesn't, those things are kind of just like implement, implementation details of the bigger picture, which is like, am I progressing um, as a developer? Which I think is the more important question. It's like such an absolute thing too, right? Like it's not relative. You know, it's it's yeah. easy to compare ourselves to other people sometimes, you know, but the reality of it is like we all have different backgrounds, right? Like we all come from yeah. different places and different times. Like it just, you know, comparing yourself to somebody else, you know, there's a really good chance that you're setting yourself up for failure, but, but you also don't know their full story. Like you don't know, like, you know, what they went through or whatever. And so exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you can't compare yourself to them. So the, the example I always use is like, cause I see this, I see this so often where it's like, Oh, coding isn't for me. Like, uh, you know, Jill picked it up so quick and like, I've been doing this so much longer than her and I'm struggling. Well, it's like maybe Jill went to a private school, right? Maybe she was like on the chess team and she was like a chess prodigy for four years. Like we don't know what Jill's background is, but like just because she picked it up quicker than you doesn't mean you can't pick it up. Right. It's just like, you're going to be a little bit slower and that's totally fine. And that, that's what, and, and I'm so passionate about this because like I, I used to be that person. I didn't start programming until I was like 22. Um, and that's the time I remember it was just like so hard. And I was like, everyone, literally every single person in the world is getting this, but me. Um, and so now I like the advice I spew is just for like my younger self. Um, and it's all just like, eventually you'll get it. Eventually uh the question is like yeah when when is going to be eventually it's, it's different for everybody um but i've never seen someone who has really been passionate about coding who's really dedicated themselves to it who hasn't been successful after like n amount of time and it's just it's, n is kind of it varies based on the person so um i've seen quite a few different resources that have come out over the last couple of weeks and months even um where people have like created youtube videos and blog posts do you recommend any areas where people can like go if they do want to learn some of the new React APIs? Like, uh, like what are the better places to 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 learn that stuff? Yep. So there's one post specifically that I've actually been referencing. Uh, I don't. He has a foreign name, so I'm going to totally butcher it. Uh, if you Google what's new in React 16.3, you'll get his post. Um, he wrote it back in February. It seems. <laughs> Uh, just a few months ago. It seems like forever ago in our industry. Uh, Bartosz. Um, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. That's been, as far as like what changes are new in the React space, that's been really good. Um, if you want, uh, and these are, I'll get to more like broad uh, examples in a second matter. Um, this post specifically is really good. If you watch Dan Abramoff's talk at JS, like Iceland or something, I don't know exactly uh, where... Uh, that talk was out. He gave a really good one on uh, even past 16.3, kind of the future uh, of React. As far as more general topics, um, honestly, like Twitter is always the best answer. That's where I uh, get most of my stuff. Reddit, React uh, JS subreddit is really good. Just reddit.com slash r slash React JS. Um, get a lot of my news there. Uh, I run, and I'm plugging this because you ask, uh, React newsletter. Uh, I think is really good every week. It's like every Thursday, I'll curate uh, some of the best posts for that week. Um, so between those three things, you should be pretty up to date uh, in the React space. If you want to know who to follow on Twitter, I have a very curated uh, list of people I follow on Twitter. Uh, mostly all of them are in the React space. So you can check out who I follow on Twitter um, and it should be hopefully some pretty, pretty intelligent people. So as far as... Like, let's move towards maybe like React web specific stuff. I'm kind of curious. I haven't developed a, Re well, I guess I've developed a React web application about six months ago, but you know, that's kind of like, um, I guess it's on the verge of being not that long, but also kind of long enough for a lot of things yeah, that have yeah. changed. But, but even then I wasn't really that plugged in. I'm kind of curious, like, what are the standards that people are using? I'm, I'm I'm not only curious, I guess I am curious about the things that are like hot right now, but maybe more so the things that have uh, lasted a long time that are probably going to you know, continue to last and maybe other things that people could, should kind of look at and things like, I guess, around, um, I had mentioned styling before, but also yep. around like, you know, um, typing, like, you know, are people using flow? Are they using TypeScript and just anything in general, I guess. When you start a new project, typically you need things like a domain name, hosting, things like that. 
When I choose hosting, I pick mine for the options it gives. I like to know what I'm getting and set things up just how I like them. This is why for your projects, you should check out Linode. Linode servers feature native SSD storage, a 40 gigabyte network, and Intel E5 processors. That's all the power you need to run VMs under full control or Docker containers, who doesn't love that, encrypted disks and VPNs. Plus, they have 10 data centers across the world and add-ons like backups, node balancer, and long view to help you control your server costs. They also offer block storage for your static files, and you can get started with a $20 credit if you use the code REACTNATIVE2018. That credit is good for four months on their one gigabyte server. That's a lot of time to try them out and see if they're the right fit for you. That code again is REACTNATIVE2018. Also, if you're interested in working for Linode, they're hiring. Head to linode.com slash careers to see their available positions. Totally. So this is, uh, I'll put an asterisk on this. This is completely my very biased, uh, might not be the actual reality of the world. This is kind of just what I've seen um, being pretty involved in the React community. It seems like as far as styling goes, um, styled components is like the way to do it now. Uh, there's a few other ones. I know like Glamour, Glamorous. Um, I I would bet, and I don't, I should probably look this up before I state it. I, I it feels like styled components is winning if if that's like a term we can use, like if they're competing against each other, which still feels weird. Um, but as far as styling goes, it feels like styled components is, is being more settled on than the others, if that makes sense. Um, so as, as far as styling goes, that's what I would say. Uh, create React app, even though it's like it's been out for a while, it still feels like uh, it's just a fantastic tool for basically everyone. Like whether you're like starting out and you just want a React app and you're like a beginner or I know there's people using it in production and they just like eject when they want to uh, roll their own like Webpack config and stuff. Um, so that's like, it, it feels like Create React App is still the way and, and I think it'll still be the way to like kind of bootstrap a React App in the future. Um, Apollo is one and you would have way more knowledge on this matter than I do. Um, that feels like it's uh, really starting to take off. Uh, I haven't looked much at it to be completely honest. I just see it a lot on my Twitter feed. Um, and I know that's kind of, isn't really like totally in the react space, but it kind of feels like it is. Um, so those would be the three, really two, cause create react app doesn't really count. Uh, the two kind of trends that I see like trending upwards up into the right, um, at, at least in kind of in the react space. Yeah, totally. Uh, I kind of agree with that. I know that, um, Apollo is definitely, definitely, you know, huge right now. There's just uh, a lot of functionality that it, it offers that just isn't there in any other GraphQL client. I know that uh, Ken Wheeler and Formidable Labs, they introduced Urkel, which is like um, kind yeah. of like a lightweight version of, of Apollo with a little bit different of an API. It's actually just a, a different implementation of a GraphQL client. Um, yeah. It's really good, but like it doesn't right now sub support subscriptions. So that's pretty usually a pretty important thing for most GraphQL apps. I know they're going to add it, but um, for right now, yeah, Apollo is definitely um, leading the way with this uh, everything as far as like um, you know features are concerned. Um, I've used Glamour as part of my last project. I think with style components, it's kind of like it's really popular, but it's kind of like you have to buy in on the idea of like creating an, a separate component almost for every style. Is that is that right, or can you? Is there another way to do that? I think you could still have just like a general style sheet. Uh, why I like it is, you, yeah, you kind of get the best worlds where I, I still like style sheets work a lot of the times for me. Um, so a lot of the times I will have just like a general .css style sheet that I'll include like in my index.html file. Um, but what's cool about style components is that like, yeah, you can have, it, it, you really buy into the component model, I guess is a better way to say it with style components because like, uh, you treat your styles like you treat anything else in a React app where it's just like components, right? So it is true that you, uh, you're you essentially buying into the idea that your separation of concerns, I guess, is at the component level uh, uh, rather than at like the technology level, is, I guess, a good way to say it. I know Glamorous uh, is that same idea, and, and I'm getting a little bit outside of my expert zone here. Uh, at least as far as I know, the biggest differences between styled components and Glamorous is... Uh, styled components, you use like that tag template. So you're basically using like a string to uh, create your like, it, it's really like, it's, it's like real CSS and I use like quotation marks there. Um, but you're in like, you, you write your CSS like you normally would. 
Where with Glamorous, and again, I can see Dodds, I know will tweet at me if I'm wrong on this, which is fine. Uh, Glamorous is more like a, you're using like objects, and it's more like kind of like JavaScript y focused. Um, I know there's obviously like more differences in that, but at least like when I read about the two differences uh, when Glamorous first came out, uh, those were like the two like kind of foundational differences. I want to throw uh, emotion into the ring too. If you heard, yeah, it. yeah, yeah, I, I've heard of it. I know nothing about it. So emotion is super high performance, uh, super lightweight. I mean, uh, Gzip, it's five kilobytes. No, Gzip 14. Um, they use a, a aggressive uh, caching in production. Um, it was sort of. Um, it was sort of loosely based on Glamour, um, and then Kai introduced a, a Babel plugin, which I think like took it to the next level. I think uh -huh. some other libraries use a Babel plugin too, but that like that's what like really set it apart. And they're still continually improving the performance of it. Um, there's a lot of people using it in like the Preact space. So if you like, uh, you know, okay. if you like yeah. the idea yeah. of like Preact, right? Like being like super lightweight or whatever. Um, you know, there's like a big uh, community of emotion users around that, but React as well too. Um, and I think they don't have React Native yet, but they've, they've been like uh, considering doing something with it. That's cool, yeah. I, I love to see just like random people on Twitter and they're like, hey, I have this new thing. I think this is what happened. It feels like what happened with emotion. Uh, it's like, hey, I have this new thing. And everyone's like, oh my goodness, this is great. And then it like, blows up. Like, that's, I feel like that's what happened with Parcel, too. Um, is that, that's what's great about Twitter. That's what's really great about our community. Is like, you can just work on something on the weekends, and then after a few months, you release it. And then if it's good, like, generally, people will are really good with like sharing stuff. So that's cool. I've never used Parcel. Um, I guess I've sort of like, if there was any bets that I've taken... Like lately, it's just like kind of reason. Uh, so I've been being, you know, this like, s you know, startup builder person now, uh -huh. right? Where I have to focus less on, you know, like code. You're problems. in the weeds. You're, you're, you're worried about investors now. You got yeah. bigger problems. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to deal with stuff like that. So uh, I guess the little time I have, I've been investing into Reason ML, which is the new. Yeah. Uh, you know, JavaScript syntax on the OCaml ASP from Facebook um, and like Reason React, right? Yep. Which is, or React Reason, which is, you know, uh, React JS, but with the OCaml syntax. And that's been really, really cool. But I haven't like really, you know, like Parcel or any of these new things, I don't know like anything about, which is crazy for me. And as we talked about earlier, that's completely fine, Peter. No big yeah. deal. Get to it. <laughs> So yeah, uh, Peter. So what do you think about Reason as far as like the viability of it becoming like you know a big thing? And um, is it on par on parity, I guess, with features with like a, Re a React Native app? So like I feel like um, the thing that because I don't really develop in Reason, um, but I've heard nothing but good things about it. But the thing that always gets me is I feel like there's so much abstraction already going on with React Native that like that's just another layer. And I feel like we we with React Native we already run into bugs because of this some of these abstractions and we have to debug all this stuff. Does that like is that something to even take into consideration or am I thinking about this the wrong way? Um, no, I haven't really. If anything, it helps me catch bugs ahead of time. Um, so, <laughs> you know, the anger of things breaking is still there, as I joke, right? Like, except you're now like the anger is now immediate because you have a compiler, right? So <laughs> the compiler will yell at you really early on saying like, oh, these types don't match. These types don't match. And you're like, what, you know, like, what do you mean, right? Uh, so you still get angry and frustrated, but once you figure it out up front, uh, you're kind of kind of set. Um, the nice thing is like OCaml's been around for years and years. And so they're, they've got a really really awesome compiler it's super fast so uh, one of the pros is you get like this like amazing type safety with a super fast compiler so it does, you know like swift will take like you know 
tens of seconds or minutes, depending on what you're working on, to compile. Whereas I haven't been in a situation where, you know, my entire Reason app won't compile in a matter, you know, like more than like a second or two seconds tops, right? Which is really, really fast. Um, and most things are like instant. Like if you're working on like 10, 20, 30 components or whatever, right? Like it's like instantaneous. You don't even think about it. Um, there's a learning curve. So you won't be productive for a bit. Um, but yeah. as you figure out, how to type things uh you fly through your through your modules that that was going to be my question about uh the learning curve did, did you find yourself did you did you learn ocaml first or did you just go straight to the kind of reasonish syntax based on ocaml or how did you approach that so reason just went through like a big syntax change i think like a couple months ago now Reason yeah. 2 still looked a lot like OCaml, and it was a lot harder, or it felt a lot harder. Now that it looks more like uh, JavaScript, I I spend most of my time reading Buckle Script, which I can talk more about in a second. Buckle yeah. Script and like the Reason uh, 3 documentation. I Every once in a blue moon, I'll read something about OCaml, but uh, the documentation has been, and the Discord group have been, like awesome in terms of uh teaching me things gotcha so this kind of goes back to what natter said so you've, ba you've ba you can basically fully like embrace the abstraction like you don't have to worry too much about like uh lear learning ocaml and reason and reason react you can kind of just like learn reason uh you have your you know your buckle script output there if you need it uh but for the most part you should be good would you say that's true yeah i mean you spend like 80% of your time learning types, right? So um, OCaml is like insane type system, right? Which like Reason uses. Uh, the syntax is more or less the same. There's obviously like a few differences, but in terms of, you know, learning, um, it's like, you know, learning, like it'll be like us like getting used to, you know, get derived state from props and like whatever else is new, right? Like Got it's it. different. But you'll figure it out. Um, whereas, like the strict types is where you'll be like, okay, you know, what does you know what does dot t mean, or like you know, like what is ts, right? And or like what is like a uh, apostrophe, you know, function a apostrophe mean, right? So like that's where that's where like a lot of my frustration was at. But got it. You figure those things out, you know, after a while. Cool. That's good to know. Um, and I mentioned Buckle Script. So Buckle Script is the tool that compiles Reason down to JavaScript. Uh, so the Buckle Script is isn't like using like uh, Babel or anything. It's kind of like its own thing, um, and it actually compiles down code that's like pretty legible too, right? So you you might even see like demos online. Like, can you tell the difference between my like? Uh, Reason compiled JavaScript versus like my handwritten JavaScript. Um, mm -hmm. Buckle Script uses a lot of like crazy optimizations behind the scenes. So uh, your JavaScript will be lighter and more performant somehow. It's like crazy how smart all those Facebook folk are. And uh, <laughs> yeah. and Bloomberg, I think, right? Because Bloomberg makes Buckle Script. Um, so it's crazy all the people working on that problem are because it's like it's insane that something could be faster and lighter. You know, yeah, it's amazing. So, um, out of curiosity, like, where do you think you see React heading over the next couple of years? Do you see it continuing the momentum that we're currently kind of continuing to see? Um, and also, do you feel like it's kind of um, been the thing that has come to JavaScript and kind of saved all of this talk about JavaScript fatigue and kind of gotten everyone to kind of see that we, you know, all of this. Um, all of this churn like actually made something that was like really, really great. And we're going to continue to use this for a while. Or do you see things like Vue maybe kind of um, overtaking React one day or maybe something completely new, like either Reason or something completely different? Yeah, good question. So I've been, I've been hearing this for like four years now. 
where like 2015 was the year of React. And then 2016 was a year of React, and then 2017, and now 2018 is a year of React. So it's like I'm starting to be like, uh, maybe like 2020 will be the year of React as well. Like Vue is cool and it's great, uh, and a lot of people are obviously having a lot of success with it. Uh, the success of Vue doesn't need to equate to like the downfall of React, and vice versa as well. I think they can both coexist, and I think they do very nicely. And I think what's cool about it is what I've seen is both communities kind of like bounce ideas off of each other, which I think is is the right approach to take. Um, so as far as like where React is going or if it'll be overtaken anytime soon, I, I have always said, and I've said this since the beginning, is like the React team is so good at innovating, whether it was like uh, with GraphQL or React Native or like the the new like fiber stuff, like they're just so good at not really like predicting the future, but that's kind of what they're doing is like they're able to see not, uh, they're just like I, I feel like they just like make the next trends. Um, and I tweeted this like uh, when I don't remember when it was. It might have been like uh, with the new like uh, with the new async render stuff that that they've been talking about. But they're just so good at uh, evolving and kind of taking the industry forward that I will never bet. There's there's a few people in life that I never bet against. Uh, the React team is one of one of those groups of people. Um, so I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. I think in 2020, we'll still be talking about it. Um, it may have different flavors. There may be other frameworks out there. It may be completely different, but I think I think they're going to continue to pioneer UI development, um, at least for the next few years. I don't see that changing at all. As far as like where React is headed, um, I think Dan's talk kind of mentioned this. We'll get We'll get more into like, now that they've like finished uh, the React Fiber or whatever they want to call it stuff, I think there there'll be a lot of really cool, um, really cool developments around like async render type stuff as far as like loading stuff and when React renders and all of that like crazy stuff that I really don't even fully understand yet. Um, but I think we'll see new libraries built on top of that idea. I think we'll see uh, new patterns come out. Um, so I think it, what, what'll be interesting is that I think. I really think the React that we write in 2019, for good or for bad, is going to be completely different than the React that we write today. Um, I feel pretty safe assuming that. Um, so yeah, that's I guess that's where I see React going. It's like I, don't, I guess I don't know where it's going, but the React in a year is going to be different uh, than the React that's happening right now, just because of all the new uh, async uh, e stuff that's coming out. Suspense, I guess, is what Dan called it in his demo. So, yeah, I've noticed that like Vue's been, uh, you know, like really popping off. Uh, but I feel like I don't know, like you know, like 2018 is like the year of React. But you know, maybe like somewhere, you know, halfway across the world, Angular or Polymer or whatever are too. Like sometimes I wonder if uh, like I'm in a bubble, you know. Like, there's clearly people using other frameworks like Vue and Angular out there in this world, you know, like maybe more yeah. uh, React, but they're still, they're still going to be around, right? Like people are still supporting them. People are still building components for those, right? Just the communities may be a little smaller. Yeah, I, I wanted that same thing too. And then I look at my Google Analytics and it's all up into the right, which generally is like if React as well, then my site gets a lot of hits. Uh, and it's been that way since like 2000. 14, 2015. Um, I, I think definitely Vue is like the biggest, again, I hate using the word like competitor because like uh, we should learn from one another, but yeah, Vue blew up last year. I think it continues to blow up. I think for good reason, there's a lot of people, uh, and like I, I said this earlier, there's a lot of people who find Vue very, very approachable, especially beginners. And I think that's a fantastic thing. Um, and I think people like Sarah Drasner are doing a fantastic job in that ecosystem specifically. Um, Kind of showing off the benefits of you, and I think that's great. Um, I will eventually learn it, probably just like at least get like a, a surface level understanding of it, just so I can talk more intelligently about it. Um, but as far as where React is today, I love it. Uh, I think it's still growing. I think we are definitely in a bubble, uh, Peter, as far as like our Twitter bubble that we have, where, where we all follow each other. Um, but all of the like analytical data that I see outside of that um, seems to be pointing that React is still growing. People are still adopting it, um, and again, I think I think that has to do with like how innovative uh, the React team is. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, 
especially the analytics one, like it totally makes sense. You know, like if that's still going up and to the right. Uh, chances are that, you know, the React ecosystem is booming. Yeah. So before we wrap it up, is there anything that you all wanted to kind of cover that we haven't talked about already? I don't think so. I think I had a uh, I fun. The, the biggest thing is like, I just want to thank you guys uh, for doing this. It's been, I think you said now this is episode like 94, 96, something like that. Yeah. Well, uh, 96. That's, so. that, that's amazing. That's really, I know it's like to do this and to get guests and to like find people and to publish and do all of that stuff. Uh, it's not as easy as it seems. And so I just want to thank both of you for doing this um, and doing it consistently for like years now. I think it's really fantastic. It's, and so I guess like from, from the community, just want to say thank you to both of you and to really all the guests that are typically on or all the uh, panelists that are typically on. Um, I think it helps a lot more people than you realize. Um, so it's something that you should be definitely proud of. Totally, man. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, also, thank you yeah. for coming on. Um, I know you are a busy guy, so um, <laughs> for you to take some time out of your schedule to join us, we totally appreciate that. So, yeah, Absolutely. Glad to be here. Um, so I guess we'll go ahead and jump to our picks. Uh, Peter, do you have any picks tonight? My pick for the week is an article, shameless plug, uh, Learning Higher Order Components in React by Google yeah. Screen. Um, basically... The reason I wrote it is because I totally forgot about, you know, all the like the intricacies of higher order components and static methods and yeah, naming components or whatever. So all, basically, I've compiled all the mistakes I made into a resourceful article. So look for it on Medium. Um, once again, learning higher order components and React by building a loading screen. There you go. Uh, when you release that, uh, send it to me, Peter. I'll get it in the newsletter. I'll tweet about it. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> yeah. On higher order components, like this has been my pet peeve for the last couple of weeks. Um, like I feel like everyone has like moved away from higher order components to like everybody's like saying that, you know, you should do it with render props as far as like passing yeah. data around. And like, I just feel like there's so many good use cases for higher order components. And one of those is we talked about earlier, the Apollo uh, client. And like when you're doing some of these complex, um, you know, operations, GraphQL operations, you have so much going on. So sometimes you'll have like five different functions that are being called for different things. Like for instance, in a subscription and the refactored version of uh, Apollo is using like these components. So where in your render, you're actually, you know, having to handle all this stuff. Whereas before it was like encapsulated in a set of functions and then the final data was just passed into the component. You just had the data ready to work with. Now, like the new way works really well for like queries where it's just something really basic because you just have the query and the data is there. But for anything like other than that, it starts getting really nasty. Um, but I think they recognize that they're, they're not de deprecating the higher order component, but they have moved like their documentation to be um, the hardware components are like now second class kind of in their documentation and um, like the other new components are kind of like first class. I may mention this, uh, you know, to, to someone that because I know a few people there just to kind of give them my feedback. But I mean, they did this based on feedback from other people. So obviously, like I'm in the minority here, but <laughs> that's just my rant. You just got to be loud, man. That's who wins. If you're loud and you, you go to Twitter with it, you get anything you want. Yeah, but it's fun. I, I think I'm like you. I don't like to be too negative, so I just like don't say anything sometimes. Yeah, that's a good that's a good approach to Twitter. Only uh, positive vibes on Twitter. It's funny because I made a uh, I made like the first render prop uh, Apollo <laughs> component called Apollo Tote like a few months. It's your fault. Oh my goodness, it's Peter's you, fault. You caused all of this, Peter. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, like this, like sim it was literally like the basic like query. Pass in your query. You don't have to use GQL, right? Like you get a few methods, and I thought it was like <laughs> I thought it was like cool for like a couple weeks, you know. But I totally <laughs> went went back to the higher order component because I like writing small functions a little more, you know. Like I thought this was great, but I, I was just like, geez, like I could. I, I'm a, way more productive using higher order components. So I'm a little, I'm a little sad um, that the documentation and everything is like pushing you to use the render props. 
and I'm kind of wondering, like at this point, I, um, I get, I get to, uh, I, I totally understand where like the um, you, you're getting a lot of benefit out of either using high order components or render props uh, and using like a provider because you're able to work with a cache. But like I've also noticed, like we, like we at AWS, we released a new GraphQL well, QL client a couple of weeks ago, the React Amsterdam, that is basically just like fetch. Um, or like just like you know um, Axios, and it just does operations, and it, it actually handles subscriptions, which is I think we're like the only other um, client that handles subscriptions other than Apollo. But like if you're working with Redux already, there's nothing wrong with with you know handling your your um, API calls with GraphQL the same way that you've been doing with REST, and kind of just using our new client uh, and kind of working with um, you know. API calls and then updating your, your global state and things like that. Um, I think the caching, like, you know, caching is just hard. And, and Apollo has done a fantastic job in innovating there, but it's still not completely figured out. Um, there's there's always, you know, going to be use cases and, and issues that come up. And we've seen that happen, um, you know, in some of our examples, because we have another GraphQL client, our original AppSync client, that's a little more um, complex and does a lot more stuff. It's actually a fork of Apollo. So like, you know, it works great, but there's always issues that we run into with caching. So if you don't really need all the sophisticated caching, you check out uh, the Amplify GraphQL client or, or something similar to it, where you're just saying like uh, api.get this, uh, this GraphQL endpoint, and then you have the data and you can kind of just work with it from there. So I guess the pick is on to me now. Um, have you done your, you did your pick, right, Tyler? I have not done my pick. Oh, okay, but you can sorry. Go the last. <laughs> Um, okay, go ahead. Uh, do you have any picks today? I do. Uh, so on the plane over here, and this is a non-technical pick, which are my favorite. Uh, on the plane over here, I've had this bookmark for a while, but I never got around to it. And over here, I'm in San Francisco. I'm usually from Utah. Um, I've been going through, and I'll send you the link so you can post this, Natter. Uh, the Amazon shareholder letters from 1997 to the present day. Uh, so if you're interested in business, if you're interested... Uh, and uh, kind of the progress and the really like the philosophy behind Amazon. Uh, really uh, interesting stuff uh, uh, from Jeff Bezos. Bezos, don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, but yeah, if you're interested in that, I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, I've had it recommended to me by so many people and I've just put it off. Um, so now I'm finally going through them um, and they're really good. So that's my pick. Very cool. So like, you know, I work with AWS now and one of the cool things and like this is like actually against our culture kind of to like I'm not like bragging because you're you know it's like all about being humble and stuff. But one of the cool things I I found about working there is how awesome I like the culture. And I know that I'm like probably you know in a team that just happens to have extra good culture because I know that there's mm-hmm. certain areas that Amazon have a bad reputation. But um yeah, yeah. If, uh, I haven't read those letters, but um if you like kind of look into some of the. Uh, the stuff about around the AWS culture and the Amazon culture, you might be kind of like, um, you know, surprised at how certain things are done. It's just pretty interesting kind of being there now for a couple of months and getting to see it firsthand. I'm pleasantly, you know, surprised by it. Um, so my, awesome. yeah, totally. Um, my pick is a book that's uh, actually an audio book. It's also available like as a book. Um, I'm trying to learn German. Um, so the, the name of the book nice. is Learn German with Paul Noble. This is like my first time trying to learn a foreign language in uh, probably 10 years. And like this, the way that he like does things and like the way he like reiterates uh, things and the way he like just d- does things within this book has been pretty nice because I'm like listening to it in my car and then like I feel like I'm starting to actually learn without really having to try too hard. Um, so Paul Noble. So I'm not sure if he has any other books but if you're looking to learn a foreign language check out um you know his books and if you're looking to learn german in particular this book is really great and, and the audio version is is awesome so totally check that out very cool okay cool so i guess that wraps it up um we we've we've been on for about an hour uh, we've covered quite a few cool things um i think we'll go ahead and, and call it a night thanks for coming on this is uh been really great to finally having you on i know a lot of people probably know you already um but i feel like you know we covered some really interesting things that that i'm pretty sure people will take some good stuff away from here 
There we go. Uh, glad to be here. Thanks again for putting this on. Anytime, uh, I'm happy to jump on and talk. So thanks again. Okay, thanks everyone for listening and we'll see you all next week.